Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our community meetings, town hall meeting. Um, I'm Councilwoman Teresa Kell Smith, and I'm joined today by uh, Reverend Ricky Burgess, who's our Council President Pro Tem, Councilman Daniel Lavelle, who is our Council, um, the Chair of our Finance um, Committee, Councilman Bobby Wilson, who is the uh, Chairperson for our Land Use, is that right? Our Land Use and Economic Development Committee. And we're joined also by our clerk's office and by Bill Urbanic from our budget office and David Geiger from the URA. That's so we have some, we want this to be a conversation, not where um, people come in and speak like you do with a public comment. We're going to have that opportunity for you to make your comments. But during this meeting, you'll actually first we'll start with a presentation by uh, Councilman Burgess and Councilman Lavelle and then an entry by our budget office. So just so you know a little bit about what we're doing and what we've done and why we've done it. And then from there, we'll go to public comment. And the presentation is not long, it's, but it's very informative. Uh, and there we'll go to public comment and we'll take the list of registered speakers first and then we'll go on to other members. But then during your comments, typically during a public hearing, council members don't respond. During this one, uh, we can respond if you want. If a member feels like there's something they want to clarify or add to the conversation, they, they might. All of us might say something. None of us might say something, say anything. So it just depends on what the comment is. So this is a chance for us to have an actual conversation. And when the Madam Clerk will give everyone two minutes to make your statement, the Madam Clerk will hold up a red paper. And when you see that, when she holds up that red paper, please stop your commenting and then we'll move on to the members can respond and then we'll move on to the next speaker. So with that said, we'll begin to this evening with our budget director, uh, William Urbanic. There's a mic there, there's another mic there or whatever. Okay, we use this one. Okay, everybody. We all know uh, what's happened over the last 18, 19 months uh, with COVID, and we all know that the city uh, suffered a lot of financial loss, lost revenue, which the federal government determined just in the revenue that we need to be able to run our city around $232 million. But city government uh, is not like uh, the private sector or basic checking accounts. Uh, as we learned in uh, elementary school, in our civics classes, the legislative branch of government is the one that holds the purse strings. Uh, what this means here is that for the mayor and the department directors to go and rehire hundreds of positions that we froze last May, um, an, official, an official action needed to happen, and that was the, the reopening of our budget uh, from 2021. And that's basically what council had done a couple weeks ago was to reinsert the funds that were given uh, to the city uh, to help us be able to run the, the government properly. Now, we operate also on a five-year plan, so whenever we pass the budget, we have to keep it balanced. That's by law. So we do that, and we make sure that the five-year plan's balanced as well. But remember, annually, we go back and relook at that, depending upon how well we manage and, and what kind of emergencies and other expenses come up. Uh, there will either be more money or less money. Um, so in order to put those positions back, we need to do something right away in July. And that's basically what this council did, was to allow the hiring of, of uh, the retention of, of city officers, city EMS, of uh, public workers, uh, of our parks folks to be able to open the parks and all that kind of stuff satisfactory. But just because council did that, as I mentioned, it's not permanently set in stone forever. Uh, we've already started working on the uh, 2022 budget, operating budget, uh, and we're also working right now on the 2022 capital budget. Now that 2021 and 22 uh, capital budget that we're working on right now can be amended at any time throughout the year. So that also is not necessarily set in stone, although many of the projects and things that will be mentioned have been things that have been vetted uh, by council and through the community and through all the department directors of the city. 
Um, so, you know, once again, council's required to produce that five-year plan uh, and make sure that those jobs were reinstated. They, they not only froze positions, positions were eliminated um, as well, too. So some of those had to go back in order for us to operate the city properly. When that budget was first passed uh, in December of 2020, we didn't know whether we were going to get any relief from the federal government or not. So this was something that was going to happen, was going to be dracon those draconian cuts. Uh, and that's all I have to say for now because uh, we have a great presentation from our members here. Reverend Burgess? Oh, is that, uh, is, is, am I doing right? Yeah, you got the right one. I got the right one. All right, so um, I'm Reverend Ricky Burgess. I'm glad I will share this presentation with Councilman Lavelle. I just want to thank Councilman Bobby Wilson for welcoming us and being in his district. You have an excellent council person who is also my friend. And so um, we're going to talk about the allocation plan and the funding from the American Rescue Plan of 2021. I will go through the first part of it, and Councilman Lavelle will go through the second part to talk about specific equity highlights. I will give you an overview of kind of how we got to the point in the first place. The COVID-19 pandemic created a fiscal emergency in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, luckily, um, we have been saving money, the mayor and council, we've been saving money for many, many years once we get left Act 47. And so if we had not had that budget surplus, if we had not saved money, we would have had to lay off people probably in February or March. Um, um, however, the, um, um, because of the um, lost revenue, the um, we would have laid off 600 employees by July 1st. If we had not had, um, if we had not had additional funds by the federal government, July 1st, we would have been forced to lay off 600 employees, including firefighters, paramedics, police, as well as eliminate city services. Thankfully, in March 2021, the American Rescue Plan, ARP, allowed the city to restore its 2021 budget and the required five-year plan. The American Rescue Plan provided funds to local governments. We are not the only government to receive these funds. The state received funds themselves, but we're talking about local government. There are three local governments um, uh, that received these funds uh, for us. One was the County of Allegheny. They received $380 million, and as Olivia can tell you, they are now uh, deciding how those funds will be distributed. The city of Pittsburgh received $335 million, and the school district of Pittsburgh received $80 million. Now, one of the things, when people, when you ever hear people talk about other cities, and we don't really get a chance to, to say this much, when people talk about other cities and compare us to other cities, every city is slightly different. Every city is slightly unique. It's hard to compare cities to cities. For instance, in Philadelphia, I'll talk about that in a minute, Philadelphia has its own human service department. It is both a city and a county. Where we're not a city and a county, the county provides our human services in terms of social work and after school programming. That's paid for by the county. That's not a city function. The county of Allegheny, um, each of the government entities performs different functions. The county of Allegheny does human services, um, State-funded social services are provided by the counties, except Philadelphia. They do criminal justice in the court system, the district attorneys, court of common pleas, Allegheny County Jail. They also do, through the community college, adult education. Um, the city of Pittsburgh, we do a different function. We do primarily public safety, that's fire, EMS, police, and code enforcement. We do public infrastructure, that is public works, mobility, we do streets, paving, maintenance, parking, right of way. We do refuge, sanitation. Also through the PWSA, Pittsburgh Water Sewer Authority, and through Alcasan, we do drinking water, wastewater, wastewater and stormwater management. Um, um, through our authorities, uh, we do some other things. The Urban Redevelopment Authority, the URA, that does for sale housing and affordable housing. It does business, economic, and neighborhood development. The Housing Authority of the City of Pittsburgh, it's charged with doing public housing and affordable housing. 
Finally, the school district of Pittsburgh does early childhood services. They provide elementary education, secondary education, and school transportation um, uh, stuff. Um, the school board actually does from about three years old to 21. Once you hit 21, you age out of the system, and then you're picked up either by the Allegheny Intermediate Unit, depends on what it is you, your needs are educationally, or the Community College of Allegheny County. So let's talk about Pittsburgh specifically. The city is receiving a $335 million allocation. That allocation is divided into two equal payments. Uh, this summer, we received from the federal government $165.5 million. And then next summer, we will receive another $167.5 million. Now, these funds are not funds that we can allocate um, um, just anywhere. It, there's four federal, federal, federal guidelines and formulas as to how these monies should be spent and must be spent. First of all, they need to be under contract and spent by December 31st, 2026. Federal formula dictates that the city can receive funding to replace revenue lost by the pandemic. So the reason we got this money is because of the money we lost um, last year, this year, and what they estimate next year's revenue losses will be. So the money is to offset lost revenue. For instance, we didn't have um, power games, we didn't have entertainment, we didn't have concerts. All of those are lost revenue. Um, federal, um, um, it says for operating expenses to restore the payroll, to avoid layoff, and to fulfill positions necessary to fully operate the city. Now what we did was the city created a trust fund. All this money went directly into a trust fund. And this is a way to strengthen accounting and increase public transparency. So we'll be able to account for every dollar taken out of the trust fund and used for some city purpose. The ARP funds are specifically designed to be spent on things the city would normally spend money on on its regular course of business. So the things that we already do is how this money is supposed to be delegated. It's not for a time for us to spend money on some new idea or something we haven't done. That's not the purpose of these funds. These funds are designed to be spent on the things the city already does. ARP funds are designed to be spent on essential city services, but there is a small amount of discretionary money. Most of the money will go into everyday city services. Um, federal best practices indicates that any discretionary spending be invested primarily in long-term capital investment, like housing or roads, not in after-school programming, not in counseling, not in um, paying um, nonprofits. That's not um, a capital expense. The city's discretionary spending should be used for transformational purposes instead of for transactional and temporary items. Significant ARP funds spent on non-essential programs or programs not substantially related to the city's essential obligations could have and would have significant unforeseen consequences. Our budget is very complex. Some of our budget is negotiated by contract. Some, we have, there's a variety of ways our budget is structured. If we start spending money on things that are not inherently cities, city functions, it will have an impact in our budget negotiations, it will have an impact on the budget moving forward. It's not as easy as just, you know, um, making a choice. The ARP funds, then, are allocated to ensure the ongoing delivery of essential government services. We are not primarily designed to fund they were not primarily designed to fund private for profit entities or market based activities. We're not primarily intended to fund community based or non profit entities. The CARES Act, there was a different funding stream for that. The CARES Act of 2020 and other federal programs allotted significant funds to assist individuals, for profit, and non profit entities and social service providers. That's a different pot of money. That's not this money. So what we did do is this. We enacted the Equity First Spending Plan to do a couple of things. To account for funds necessary to avert layoffs or job termination of city employees, fund public infrastructure, lead water line replacements, neighborhood recreation centers, and other quality of life investments. Prioritize investments in community and economic development projects in the city's black neighborhoods. One of the things, and, and Councilman Lavelle talked about this in detail, one of the things that um, you may not 
give at first blush that one of the things we're doing is we're buying new city equipment. And you say, well, what does that have to do with black communities? Well, when we um, shovel, when the snow plows shovel streets, they shovel streets based on occupancy and transportation. So that the more people travel the streets, they're called primary roads, they will get sold it, they will get plowed first all the time. So places like Fifth Avenue is always going to get plowed. Forbes Avenue is always going to get plowed because the universities are there. Many of our black communities now are dense, are not, no longer densely populated. So when you have old equipment, what happens is they break down. So when they break down, the places that are least populated will wind up being the places that are not plowed, not salted. So by having old equipment, we literally generally won't be able to do the resources in black communities. So by investing in new communities, not only are we making it more efficient, we're actually going to provide more services to African American and lower income communities. Okay, last thing, I'll let, I'll let uh, Cosmo Love all talk about that. Let, first of all, it talks about where the money, how the money was, was guesstimated by the federal government. There's a sheet, sheet 13. That gives you a sense of where the money came from and kind of with the areas that the federal government decided we were going to lose money at. And that's where that $167 million a year came from. Those were clear the categories of funding loss and how they designed or estimated where our money would, would come from. The next slide then tells you in big buckets where the money's being spent. There are five or so major uh, places, um, they're being spent in the operating budget so that we don't fire police officers, uh, firefighters, public works, people who take care of the parks. Um, that's the bulk of the money, uh, as you see, um, over the next five, five years. Um, the next is capital. Capital are, are pro things that last over five years, and that's rebuilding rec centers and, and those sort of things. Um, the next is a special revenue lead paint project where we are going to, um, we know that lead paint is a primary way children receive lead and there's a, some money uh, to try to alleviate that. The URA uh, gets a significant chunk of money. That's what's going to do your affordable housing and your um, trying to get home ownership, um, especially for low and, and moderate income uh, people. Uh, the Pittsburgh Th Parking Authority gets a little bit of money. The way they're going to get the bulk of their money, we cannot give them a lot of money directly, but we're going to forego their payments to the city over a period of years. Usually, they have to give the city a significant payment. We're going to reduce the amount of payment they gave us because during COVID, their parking lots have been empty. The parking lots, the parking garages have been empty. They've lost a significant amount of resources because of COVID. Uh, the PWSA, we're going to put money into making sure that they replace the lead water lines, so especially in communities of color. Uh, one PGH is guaranteed income. There is going to be a power program where a group of people, not limited to, but primary single mothers with children, and giving them a monthly stipend, uh, uh, just a monthly stipend. What they found out is when you give um, mothers more money, believe it or not, they don't spend it on the casino. They don't spend it on drinking. They don't spend it frivolously. They spend the money buying the children higher nutrition. They spend their money on clothing their children. They spend it on having a better quality of life for them and their families. And so I will stop there. That kind of shows you the overall way in which the money is going to be allocated. And then Cosmo Lovell will talk specifically about its equity component. Thank you, and thank you all for allowing us to be here this evening. One additional thing I want to mention is there have been, we've received a lot of questions about why not simply budget for this year but not, and not budget for the outlying years. By state law, we have to budget in five-year increments. We cannot simply open the 2021 budget and not make the next four years and not balance those dollars as well, which is part of the reason why we've had the budget for all the money that's coming in, because we have to do it in five-year increments. So going into our operating budget is going to be approximately $175 million that goes directly into our operating budget. First and foremost, based upon what Reverend Burgess just shared with you, we wanted to make sure that based upon how we're legally allowed to spend the money and how the city functions, that we were intentionally doing it in an equitable way and intentionally 
trying to build, rebuild up and build out and fix communities of color and communities that have been seeing lack of investment over the years. And we wanted to pour money into those physical places as well as the people who actually live there. So he already spoke about and gave the example of our snow plows. So we're gonna put $13 million into replacing our aging vehicle fleet, including those used by DPW, and that will help us in communities where we haven't seen these services as well, patch the potholes, remove the snow, treat the roads, sweep the streets, and even clearing out the catch basins. Um, just as an example, last uh, winter, when we had our one snow, and we council members all received calls about snow not being cleared, half our fleet was down, which was part of the problem and why then we're not being as effective as we would like to be. In addition to clean and safe neighborhoods, we want to make sure that no community, no resident, excuse me, deserves to live in a neighborhood with overgrown, trash-strung, vacant lots and dilapidated buildings. Each one of us, and I believe, well, I believe I can speak for each one of us, one of the highest calls that we get in our office regarding constituent affairs is either a house that needs demolished, a house that needs boarded up, or, or grass that needs cut. And again, we don't have all the resources to do it as effectively as we would like to. Therefore, we're dedicating $18 million to vacant property maintenance. This will allow us to maintain our property. It will allow us to demolish additional buildings. And we're also going to put $10 million into the Pittsburgh Land Bank, which will, hype, which will help us begin recycling land more effectively, um, quicker, and get it into the hands of future homeowners in a much faster rate than what we currently do. We also wanted to ensure that we were in equity meant increasing preventive services instead of increased police prevention. Obviously, we heard over the course of the last year and a half that, as an easy example, the police don't necessarily need to be called for a homeless man, right? That should be done by social services. Two young boys who are arguing don't necessarily need the police for that. Rather, they, the police may be needed for higher and better usage, but there are ways to ensure that we're having social workers coming out into our, into our neighborhoods. So based upon that, we're dedicating $10 million to the Office of Community Services. And this will provide social services to residents in distress. It will also diminish the chance for unnecessary interaction with law enforcement. There are a number of nation nationwide programs that we're modeling this effort after. And we're be be doing the training now where hopefully in the future we, we will even have social service workers or others who can ride along with police and to assist and decrease the interaction. Moving on to our capital budget, we are putting approximately a little less than $60 million into our capital budget. One of the things we wanted to do is ensure that there were safe places and spaces for all our children to actually go. So we're dedicating $20 million to upgrade city facilities across the entire city. Some of these facilities, like Jefferson Rec Center, and which is in Central Northside, is being rehabbed, um, putting brand new resources into it. Some of these facilities will actually be rebuilt from the ground up. One of the things we're also going to be able to do, the ARP guidelines say that we can use the money for broadband. So now we're going to be able to ensure that all our facilities have broadband in them. There's facilities that don't have air conditioning. We'll be able to provide air conditioning. But we will increase and better all our facilities across the city, many of which not only children, but our seniors use, utilize too. And many, oftentimes, we have community meetings there, and we do all those sort of things. We're also going to be putting our rec to tech program in these facilities, which is, sort of, which is a, modern, a modern computer lab. So many of our children in the after school programming have modern facilities to, to do their work on. We're also going to be sending over $17.5 million to PWSA. The reason we are doing this is to avoid PWSA having to do lending to fix up all their infrastructure. If they had to do it on their own, they would have to take out a bond, they would have to borrow, and they would essentially charge you, the ratepayer, for that increase in order to be able to pay it back. So this is going to save ratepayers in our city a significant amount of money. Um, in addition to that, it ensures that our communities have clean, safe, and affordable drinking water. Therefore, that $17 million will protect the public's health by continuing to replace lead water lines. And as I mentioned, it also prevents runaway rate increases by allowing PWSA to avoid paying $43 million in debt service to borrow the same amount of money to do the needed work. Next, we're going to put 
a little less than $75 million into our Urban Redevelopment Authority. One, first and foremost, we're dedicating $22 million to own PGH because we believe that every person should be able to own a clean, decent home at whatever rate they can afford. And own PGH will allow us to begin renovating the vacant homes and sell them to residents and families with low to moderate incomes to foster higher levels of home ownership across the city. We are also going to provide more affordable housing. And therefore, we're putting $5 million into saving existing affordable housing because it's less expensive to preserve housing than it is to build new housing. We literally, we did the study. We know we had a shortage of 17,000 units of affordable housing. You cannot build your way out of that. What you can do is begin stabilizing all the vacant property, turning those into affordable home ownership opportunities. Um, so this dedicates $5 million to establishing and expanding community land trusts so that residents and not developers will actually own the land itself and be able to control the destination of the community. We're also putting an additional $10 million to assist qualified renters and homeowners and not pay their utility bills, but rather begin fixing up their home to lower their utility bills. So helping with um, energy savings, helping with new windows, new roofing, fixed dormers, do all the necessary things that will bring utility costs down, which we know in communities of color and low income neighborhoods, they're paying higher utility bills to more affluent neighborhoods. We're also trying to rebuild black business districts and create black wealth within our city. Therefore, we're dedicating $7 million to rebuild black business districts across the city, both in the Hill District, both in Sheridan and Chartier City, in Homewood, in Hazelwood, Larimer, and Perry North South and Perry Hilltop along Perrysville Avenue, and as well as Belt Silver and Allentown. This will help start new businesses. This can help renovate current storefronts. This could help a small a business get a loan. Um, in addition to that, we've also sent money to the URA. With, during the pandemic, the URA provided many, many loans to people to, so they could stay afloat. We're providing, I want to say it's $3 million? $3.5 million to the URA to basically allow the URA to forgive all the loans that they made to businesses during the pandemic. So they do not now, they no longer have to pay us back. It was a grant, it's written off their books. Um, in addition, well, we, I spoke about that, excuse me. And then lastly, Reverend Bird just mentioned it, um, we're going to put $2.5 million into own PGH, one PGH, excuse me, um, which is to support the Guaranteed Basic Income Pilot Program. What we also found out when we started looking into this initiative, per state law, the city of Pittsburgh cannot simply hand you a check. Even if I wanted to, I can't say, here's $500 a month, which is what the stipend is going to be. Here's $500 a month to help you out. We legally cannot do that. So we have to run it through a nonprofit entity. So one PGH is a nonprofit entity that will then cut those checks it, as part of the pilot program, which hopefully we'll be able to expand over the years coming. And I believe that concludes our presentation, so I will turn it over to President Smith. Thank you. So you should have, or there are two different things you can have. So the PowerPoint many of you have, there's also a second sheet that some of you have but may not have that lists all, the, that sh the second sheet ex lists every single item of expense. We went over broad categories, but there is another sheet that, that lists every single expense of the ARP funds. So you can have them in the back. So if you don't have that, you can get in the back and you can see every single project so that every dollar is accounted for. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend and Councilman Laval, for a great, another great presentation. With that said, we're going to open it up to our list of registered speakers first. And I just ask that you come to the microphone. When Madam Clerk raises the, where are you going to sit there? Okay, Madam Clerk raises the red paper. Please, you know, yield your, the time at the microphone. And um, if members want to respond, they'll respond. And if not, I'll call the next speaker. And in the meantime, our clerk, who's amazing, brought all kinds of snacks and drinks in the back. Please help yourself throughout the meeting. If you want to just get up and go in the back, just feel comfortable just getting up and going, grab a drink or something to snack on um, throughout the meeting. That said, our first speaker is Betty Pickett. 
Is Betty here? Betty Pickett. Okay. Our next speaker is Mark Brentley Sr. Director Brentley. Good evening, Director. Uh, good evening, members of Council. Mark, Mark Brentley Sr., former member of the Pittsburgh School Board. I served 16 years as an elected member of the Pittsburgh School Board. I am here uh, today uh, to just echo what my comments were last week. Uh, this, sh these meetings, and I think there are a total of four or five you had, they should be titled the Apology Tour because really what you did, you, you actually put the cart before the horse in this process. You're sharing information with us that's a moot point. It's after the fact. You've already voted on it. And I would hope that the folks, the folks here today would not attempt to get in the weeds with particular items. This is an issue where we are strongly encouraging members of council to simply go public and apologize for moving forward without getting our input on the beginning. And you can simply do that by simply rescinding the vote, canceling vote, don't know what the actual term is, but that's all that it requires to do. This continues to create division in our community. And as I said before, I don't want to be pitted up against another nonprofit and this one got to squeeze this one and this one deserves more and we have to fight. You were wrong, members of council. And it takes real leadership to come forward and say, oops, we moved too fast and let's back up and let's make this thing work. Why should you do it? For good government. And so that we can develop the trust that we had for all of you uh, that we should have. And so I'm asking again, please talk to the mayor and have a press, a joint press conference and just you know, whatever you got to say, but let's stop it where it is, move forward. And let's not forget, too, that uh, this process that you've put together that, that spends damn near all the money, how unfair to the incoming administration in, November, in December, whoever he may be or she may be, uh, that's unfair to spend those dollars and they not have an opportunity to have an input as to how these dollars are spent. Outgoing administration does not get that luxury to spend and commit to the incoming administration. Thank you very much. Please reverse your decision. Thank you. So I want to make two, two, two quick remarks. Um, one, regarding the new administration, every single year, city council works with the administration on a budget. Every single year it happens. Whenever whom he may, whom, whomever the winner may be, when they come into office next year, they will be able to work with council on how they feel dollars should be spent. As indicated at the very beginning of this meeting, dollars can be changed, but we had to put these dollars in place now. All the dollars will not be spent until 2026. So there will be plenty of time to work with the new administration. That's one. Two, no, I have no intention of apologizing for doing my job. And I say that because all year long, and I'm, there's people in this room who have called my office and said, Councilman Lavelle, you need to do X. You need to clean up this lot. You need to tear down this home. You need to help these businesses. You need to put more affordable, affordable housing here. You need to do all these things. Even the year prior to COVID, we had community meetings. Councilman Lavelle, will you please re restore, rebuild Jefferson Rec Center? Uh, Davis Avenue Bridge, Co Councilman, he's received those calls for the last year, two years. And so when we go to budget, budgeting doesn't happen a month before you go to pass a budget. Budget happens when all year long, or, all, or the two years prior to that budget, I've got a list, a litany of things that have been, residents throughout my district, residents throughout the city have said, we need this. So when we put together this list, it's based upon a year's worth of hearing what people were calling for, what people were asking us to do. It doesn't happen when all of a sudden you, someone hands you a check and now you create a budget. That's a year long process. Thank you. Thank you. No, thanks. 
All right. So I can echo those comments. I just want to make one uh, clarification about spending this money, which is, I think, a very important uh, point to make. The bridge that I came across to, to arrive here today was the Swindle Bridge. And it goes from Northview to the Charles Street, or it goes from Charles Street to Northview. A lot of you may look at that bridge and go, that is one terrible bridge because it's in bad shape. That bridge is funded. That bridge is funded to get repaired, and it's going to take two years just to even get that under contract. So we talk about loss of revenue, and we look towards um, you know, how this money is being allocated right now. There's projects in here that we need those, 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 mark, those, those place marks for that. You know, we need that allocated now for projects similar to that one. I mean, that one was funded a couple years ago, but projects that are similar to that so that it actually doesn't hurt communities. If we have to close down that bridge, that's not a good situation for anyone here. Lastly, I'm sorry. Lastly, to that point, there's also projects, and Reverend Burr just mentioned the white sheet that details every single thing. There are also projects in there that we budgeted for previously, but because of COVID, the cost to do that project may have gone up a half a million dollars, a million dollars. If not for these dollars, those projects would have fallen off by the wayside. And so some of this money is literally to finish what we tried to start prior to that as well. Thank you. Good. Okay, thank you, everyone. Our next speaker is Ikahana Hel McKenna. And you've been amazing. You've come to this is your third meeting. You've come to all, so that's great. Thank you. Thank you. And last meeting, she brought her niece who stole the show. <laughs> or a cousin, right? <laughs> Thank you, City Council members, for hearing my words today. For, uh, before I get started, my title is Ikahana Hal Makina. I am the Grand Inca, the Iroquois Confederacy of Aborigine American People. And for those of you who do not know what Aborigine is, it's simply the equivalent of being an Indian. And so I speak with the voice of my ancestors. There's something that I realized from the previous meetings that my, the voice of my people, the nation that I am the leader of, were being misunderstood. We collectively, collectively as a nation, have already put in over 10,000 hours of volunteering, helping the citizens of Pittsburgh. One example is, I took in a single mother with her child, facing homelessness because her time at the shelter was up. I opened my doors, the doors of my home, and allowed her and her child to stay with me and my family. These are the things, these are the stories that you don't get to hear. When we come to city council and speak about the needs of the Aboriginal American people, we're doing this off the resources that we have that we bring into our home. Not because we've been granted money or given money or given funds, it is our own dollars that we're doing this with because we care about the people. And with that being said, I am feeding them, I am sheltering them. This isn't a rare occurrence for me or the people of my nation. This is very common. We give out food bags, we put in man hours, we work on farms, we labor for the people. I also provide transportation services for single mothers who can't get to grocery stores, who can't get to doctor's appointment. In fact, I did it today. I'm coming from having done so today. My daughter and I, because she sees the work that her mother puts in, has a passion for helping homeless people. So I created a donation fund that we go to the store and we don't do uh, food pantry food. We actually go to places like Johnny Gore, Aldi's, and purchase food for giving it to single families who don't have food during this pandemic prior to you know, the government stepping in because it took them a while to react. Thank and you. so in the interim, we mobilize. Thank and you. I just want to say, if I can wrap up my thought here Please today, see. I just want to say that, you know, a lot of the monies that you have allocated to certain nonprofits, you have to jump through hoops. And I echo the sentiment of uh, Mark Brentley that 
there's all these hoops. Who are, are you going to ensure that these funds are really allocated to the people who really need those funds? Because a lot of these organizations that you make the cut the check to and, and forget about it, these organizations are making people jump through hoops, go under, go high, go low, and then they still say no. Thank you. Pumai Sharma. I'm going to let me spell you. Oh, you're here already up here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. With a name like Smith, you know, every name's hard for me. <laughs> thank you. Um, in Lakesh Elakain, everyone, I am Shambin Pomai Chapmam Yahalahi. I am the medicine woman for the nation, the Iroquois Confederacy of Aboriginal American People. I have worked um, diligently in helping assist people in the city of Pittsburgh, and not just my own people in my nation, all walks, all ethnic groups, in my healing space. Now, a lot of times people have come to me, they've not had funds, because I am not, uh, I do not take insurance or any of those things. These are indigenous methods of healing. So these, are, these methods have been around since time immemorial. And so when people have come to my place of um, healing, they've come sometimes empty handed, and I would turn no one away. And so these are the stories that don't get spoken of. But I will say, um, Ed Ganey had, um, uh, actually it was Brother Ill, who had given a proclamation um, to myself for the work that I've been doing here in the city of Pittsburgh, but more importantly in Pennsylvania and around the country. And I've also been recognized by um, other community groups, such as Community Empowerment Association, uh, for the work that I've done in the black and African American community. I myself am Aborigine. I'm indigenous to these lands. I am the autochthonous. I am the onkwe onwe in our language, which means the original people. And people have have been mistaking us, the Aborigines, as quote unquote black people or African American people. And I get that because they look at skin type and they look at hair texture and they don't ask people, who are you? Where do you come from? You come from a people. What people do you come from? We don't allow that to stop us from helping people who identify as black, African American, um, Italian, German, Russian. I have clients all over the world. And when you are distributing these funds to nonprofit groups, I don't think they're paying attention and they have a listening ear of the people who are doing this work without seeking grant funding, without seeking uh, you know, notification or I guess appreciation from those kind of bodies. Although we are important and we do need assistance in helping to continue to do those things within the community. And I would say I thank everyone for giving me this opportunity to speak. There are many of us that are coming into these territories by the thousands. So, you know, there's going to have to be something City Council is going to have to address the Iroquois Confederacy and Aborigine people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments and for your work. Next speaker is Anita White. Anita White. Okay. And I don't see Anita, so we'll call Bob Damewood. Little one, this one. There you go. There you go. Thank you. All right. Well, um, good evening, members of council. Uh, it, it, I, I can't say what I need to say in in two minutes. Um, but I did bring uh, written testimony. I'll I'll hand that out. Uh, I I do want to say. So, Councilman Lavelle, you. You said, you know, rightly so, that you talk to your constituents every day, right? And and um, you formed your your uh, priorities based on your conversations with your constituents. Why, well, you know, I know that your constituents have told you one thing that is hardly reflected in this ARP budget, and that is the rent is too damn high. I know that because you've been a champion for affordable rental housing in the past. So I know that you see that as a problem in your district. I think every council person sees that and hears that from the constituents every day. The rent is too damn high. That said, there's only five million out of three hundred and fifty five million dollars in this budget, you know, that's been allocated for affordable rental housing. That's less than one and a half percent of the total budget for affordable rental housing. And you know one of the one of the reasons, one of the uh, priorities for our fund, ARPA funds, 
is you know, to address the needs of those who have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. Renters have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic, and that's to be reflected in this budget. Um, I, I do want to say that um, you know, Pittsburgh has received uh, rental assistance funds. Rental assistance funds are only a short-term band-aid. They address the symptom. They don't address the underlying causes. We have a unique opportunity here to address the underlying causes of rental affordability, and I hope that um, council does that. And so I have two asks of council. Um, you know, one is, so uh, Congress is on the verge of approving an infrastructure bill that will mean millions and millions of dollars to the city of Pittsburgh for infrastructure. Uh, it, I'll finish briefly. Um, so I would ask that when that bill is passed, when that money comes to the city of Pittsburgh, that council swap out some of the infrastructure line items in this allocation and then reallocate uh, the money that is freed up to address the needs of the people who, are, who have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. The second thing that I ask is that the council not make any allocations now, any disbursements now that can't be undone later, like the funding to PWSA. This infrastructure bill that Congress is about to pass includes money for things like lead line replacement. If, if that money goes to PWSA, it can't be clawed back, okay? And so all I ask is that the council keep an eye out for this infrastructure bill and be flexible and be willing to reallocate money when, when those funds count. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are you going to leave your comments with us? Yes. Okay. If you just leave them at the end of the table here, we'll get them. Then our next speaker is Lois Lieberman. Lois Lieberman. No one here. Ann Sanders. Good evening. Hello, uh, my name is Ann Sanders. I work at Just Harvest as a public policy advocate and I also reside up by Garvin Field uh, on the north side. Um, first, I want to thank City Council for having these community meetings during the normal off time. Um, these are great. I think that more community meetings should be happening, especially when budgets come around. Budgets are boring and dry, but it's the most important job that you have on city council, uh, how you allocate our resources. Um, but when it comes to something like this, I also feel like more community outreach is necessary. This is a pretty good room of folks. I wonder how many of you took the bus here? Like if you, if you took the bus here, can you raise your hand? If you... You could have taken the bus. How many of you drove your own car You here? have to please address council. Oh, sorry. sorry. What I'm trying to say is that these meetings are not necessarily representative of the community. These are folks we tend to be more well off or have additional resources than a lot of folks that are struggling in our communities. The folks who are calling your office are folks who know who you, who you are. They know what city council's job is. There are so many people who don't know what the role of government is. We need to do outreach to those folks to find out where the needs are. People getting evicted, they're not gonna think, I'm gonna call my city council person. They're trying to figure out where they're gonna stay. So what I'm trying to say is that when it comes to allocating these funds and serving those most in need, we need to, you need to go the extra mile, do surveys, be at the bus stops, have folks you know, publicize it widely, put up posters, things like that to let people know that their, their voice matters. Um, and I also wanted to echo Bob Dean Wood's comments about um, not depositing funds that can't be taken back. Um, I understand you have to project out five years, just making sure that you're able to stay flexible as, as things change over time. Who knows what this pandemic will be or how long it will last. So we need to be able to respond and keep those funds available. Thanks. Thank you. 
Thank you, and, I, and do you want to respond? I'm just going to say that I think a lot of us are very much in touch and in tune with people that do need help. A lot of people do call our office when they need help with utilities, with rent, with food, with childcare, with whatever issues they need. Sometimes it's the last place to turn and sometimes it's the first place for people to turn. But I know many of us help people um, out of our own pockets or help people however we can. So I do want you to know that we're probably, because we're the closest level of government, the local government, I think we're more in tune than maybe um, others may be because we are, we're in the communities every day. But with that said, thank you for your comments. And I do think we do need to do better at um, outreach. And these meetings, I just want to say, were my idea to come together to do this with the community, to have conversations with people. Because I felt like there was so much being said that was inaccurate. And, and I thought that we wanted to make sure that we start talking to people so they understood. When I, t when I talk to people about what is in here, there's always nothing people in here that people don't want funded, almost nothing. I mean, there's, there's going to be something here and there. But for the most part, I think we did a pretty good job making sure we were reaching out and hearing what our constituents have been saying for a long time. Not what organizations have been saying, not what nonprofits have been saying, but what actual individual residents in our communities that live every day in our neighborhoods that we talk to every day. And I'm not opposed to giving money to nonprofits. I just want to be honest with you. I've said this to Reverend, I've said this to others, that I'm not opposed to it, but I think that there should be some criteria, not just the typical here's a check, go do something, and then we see no results. I think we have to have some results for that money. Our constituents need that results right now. Those are the results. I just want to um, talk about some of the comments that were recently made. I, I think there were great comments. Uh, actually, the last two speakers, I, you know, look over the, uh, the detailed comments afterwards uh, from Mr. Damewood. But I also just want to speak about, because there was a a topic that came up about, you know, speaking to the most vulnerable, I think, uh, was, was one of the main points of Ms. San, uh, Ms. Sanders in that, you know, whenever the, the COVID-19 uh, came about and the pandemic started, uh, this city council and, the, and this administration funded the Allegheny Health Network, Urban Poverty and Homelessness. Um, we put a, uh, enough money into the pot to help with the evictions that were going to happen. And so a lot of the, the work around these eviction numbers, uh, we were funding a team to go out and actually help individuals with those encounters with the magistrate. Um, what we realized is that was, <laughs> although it went to, th they, they put it on three different zones, three different police zones. We realize now, and what you see in this budget here, it was severely, underfunded and just the need was so great and um, so in this in these ARP funds we're funding that 24 7 all zones in the city so they can not only handle what they've been trying to handle is provide resources to people who are facing eviction but they've also been tasked with a lot of other um, uh, issues that, that that the most vulnerable face and they've been working closely with our police departments to do a co-response and uh, some other measures so that the interactions uh, between the police and uh, individuals that are experiencing homelessness, for example, um, they're implementing a new strategy. But, you know, I just want to make this point because I think it's valid to say that in every community meeting, we're faced with individuals that don't have the time to come, that, you know, uh, whether it's family, work, uh, people are working 80 hours a, a week right now to make ends meet. So the more we can engage with this, uh, this program, the AHN Urban Poverty and Homelessness Program, fund it, and actually move them into our conversation. So we have to rely on, you know, because we can't, just like it was mentioned, we can't, you know, get everyone to this meeting that we need to talk to. We can't do every budget meeting um, where everyone is engaged. Right now, before this, it was pierogies and potholes. So you had to come to community meetings and talk about your concerns at the pierogies and pothole meetings. So in the future, I'm looking at how we continually engage programs that we're funding that go into those most vulnerable uh, communities so that we have this lens that we're continually looking at and so that we're actually funding these programs or, you know, 
we're finding you know, what needs to be funded from the voices that can't make it to the meetings. Sorry, that was a little long-winded. I was just trying to explain a little bit about what we're looking for in the future. I almost got disqualified on the time limit. <laughs> Thank you, Councilman Wilson. With that said, uh, we're going to turn it over to, is there any unregistered speakers, uh, that would, people that would like to speak? Yes. It come, come, yes, please. Or you don't have to stand. You can just sit right here next to it so that you know you're next. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Council, for having me. My name's Tony Moreno. I'm a Northside resident. Everybody can look. Right here, this is the City of Pittsburgh press announcements, press releases, it's on their program. I identified from the year 2000 up until July of this year, $278 million in grants that have come through here addressing almost every single thing that's in the program, right here for the 335 million. If you laid them over each other, they all funneled down right into your URA. You are all on the URA board. Not all of you, I'm sorry, Mr. Lavelle and Mr. Burgess are on the URA board in the land bank. No, that's not true. I'll, I'll correct you when you're done. You're not, he's on the land bank and he's on the board. I'll correct you. So all this money's here. It's unspent. We don't know where it's at. Five and a half million dollars was given to Mr. Burgess. Five and a half million dollars was given to Mr. Lavelle last year out of the police budget. And those monies were supposed to be given to the group violence intervention programs, which is all is addressed in here. And it's supposed to be given to the social work programs that are supposed to go out and stop the violence. This fairy tale that this is going to work is being proven right now in the violence you see. Those groups should be out there right now stopping it, but it doesn't work. And it will never work. We are the, in the city of Pittsburgh, the state model for crisis intervention, which has been going on, training. Every officer gets trained in the city of Pittsburgh for crisis intervention, teaching the officers how to deal with people with mental health. In 2012, they introduced a program that does exactly what they're saying, that we are supposed to have mental health workers traveling with us with the trained crisis intervention officers. We found uniforms, we found vehicles, it was all set, we had the we had the volunteers from Allegheny County Mental Health. I know because I used to teach de-escalation in that course. I taught it. Hold our council people accountable. Hold our city accountable for the things that we already have and we can use. Make sure that money's being spent. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon or good evening, councilmen and my community. My name is Yvonne Rainey. I'm a community activist first, and but no, first I'm a child of God. Second, I am a community activist because Northside is my home. I think I talked to Councilman Lavelle numerous times. He kind of ignored me, but that's okay. We still, we still got an opportunity to speak. I'm not speaking for myself. I'm speaking for my home where I live at with my res with my community. You talk about allocating monies to these different nonprofits to assist the residents in their needs. And once again, like the young lady said, they jump through hoops. Families are being evicted. Go to these programs and say, oh, you gotta come back with this documentation, this documentation. That's a hiccup to them, but to the families, it's devastating. Take away the barriers. Make the resource accessible to the needs of the community. Make sure the community's at the table when you do your budget, because it affects us. Because remember this, we vote. Our voices do matter, and our vote do count. Just don't sit there and think, well, I'm in this position. No, we put you there. You are a community servant. And remember that, we vote. And we are, when our votes do matter and they do count at the polls. Thank you. Do we have another, any other speakers? Thank you, Chris. From our hey, good office. evening, Council. How are good you? Evening. Great, after, great evening. Councilman Neville, 
I do thank you for answering the phone when I called. And um, Mr. Wilson, you were just at our Perry Hilltop meeting, and we discussed some things. Um, I'm glad to see that URA is getting some money, but URA having housing, selling housing to people that will never really own them. What you do is, is you give them a percentage off on the house. Say the house is uh, 79000 and you sell it to the person for 59000 You hold that other amount on them. Then they send them to the bank where uh, the, the, the uh, mortgage does not stay the same. You may enter the mortgage at 400, and by the time they're in the home for a year and a half, two years, it spikes to the point where the people can no longer stay in the house. And I'm telling you, I know this for a fact. Perry Hilltop, phase we did all those homes, URA, help people get those homes, and I watched my neighbors walk away from those homes one by one. Now we're considered a what? A blighted area. We have homes that are torn down. We have homes uh, that people can't afford to, to fix up. People literally walked away from their homes. I thank God for Mellon Bank, which was the hardest bank to get a loan from as a single woman. As a divorced woman with four children, I thank God for Mellon Bank because they set my mortgage where it did, mine didn't spike. But the people around me, whatever banks they went through, whatever phase put them through and URA put them through, their, their mortgages spiked where they said, you know what, I'm leaving. Now, my area needs help. URA does not want people to really own their home. You, this is what you all do. They make a plan and say, okay, after 20 years, we know they're going to lose their homes. And then you get those homes back. And then you re, re, re fix them up and whatever you do, and, and then you sell them again. And then let me tell you what else they did to me personally. They sold me a home that I had to run a pipe from my address on Perrysville all the way down to Wilson Avenue. And, and thanks be to God that I knew someone in demolition to come and dig the back of my house from the back of my yard to, to Wilson Avenue because sewage, live sewage was coming up out of the ground and smelling up the neighborhood. And then you want to tell me you want to hold that on my credit? And when I had to pay out all that money to get piping done? No, URA is not right. And I will be at the next board meeting. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Hi, how are you? Please hey, just you state your name and neighborhood. Yeah, I, I uh, my name is Angus Burton, uh, Perry North. I'm um, co-founder with my partner back there, Reverend Eleanor Williams, uh, the Northside Partnership Project Community Resource Mall. And I heard a couple things in here, you know. First one I wanted to talk about was the vacant lots. You know, I see here like $18 million in here. Well, when I was a kid, they had a program called the Youth Corps, you know? And we went out and we built top lots and things like that, you know, in the city. You remember, Ray, you know, you remember and stuff. So I want to know, like, is there anything that's being put in place to put some of these kids to work, you know? In terms, man, you know, like a, a, a renovating these vacant lots and stuff, $18 million, that's a lot of money. That could put a lot of kids to work. You know, so I'm just asking. You know, is there, is, you know, is, there, is council putting anything in place? You know, for you know employment and stuff. You know, for for all these pages. You know what I'm saying? You know, that, yeah. I just want to know. You know, is council putting anything in place? You know. Do you have any other uh, comments? And then we'll we'll respond to you after you're done making yeah, your okay, comments. Yeah. Okay. You know, uh, along with that, we got. Now, also, when I was a kid, you know, there was probably about like 70 rec centers in the city. 
You know where they at? You know uh, Jefferson Wreck? Uh, I don't know what Pittsburgh Project is, des is designated as, you know, but I know Northside Partnership Project Community Resource Mall, we're designated as a community center, you know? And we will be asking, man, if we qualify for any of these funds, man, you know, that's designated for these community centers. You know? You know you, Daniel, know I'll be calling him. Bobby, know I'll be calling them. You know? Because, you know, our constituents, our constituents come from both their districts. You know? So, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, also, let me see what I got over here. I got something else. Okay. Oh, up yeah, we're talking about. We was talking about the lead pipe. We got time now, you know. Don't, don't you know? We talking about lead pipes. We got a we got a school up here, man. That's 115 years old. You understand what I'm saying? You know, and, and we're gonna be asking, do we qualify, man? You understand what I'm saying? To get the piping and stuff in there changed, cause we know, man. You know, there's some lead piping in there. Where else we at? Yeah. What else did I have, Val? Okay, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna, right. I'm going to respond to that a little bit. Are there any other speakers? Please raise your hand if you still want to speak. Okay. There's no other speakers. So, oh, you do want to speak? Okay. Let me just respond to him first, real quickly. I just want to say real quickly that. We are working on community centers. We're actually opening centers in, our, in, in, um, in this budget. And we are working on um, job creation in this as well for our youth. And we also have um, some other things, I think, that, you, that you're working with the vacant lands and, and, and different things. So there is things in this. And if you stay after this meeting, we'll all stick around a little bit. Well, I hope we will, right? We'll stick around for a few minutes just to talk to you all. Okay. In the summer youth employment program that Reverend Burgess actually increased funding for and that to help um, get kids employed in our city. So we'd we 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 employ every single young person who fill it, who completes an application, they get a summer job anywhere from fourteen to twenty one years of age. Every summer, the last two years, we employed every single qualified young person, every one of them. And so the applications uh, go out like around April, I think, they go out around April. And so that, and some of the providers have the kids doing lots, not all of them, but they're doing a variety of things across the city. They're contracted to various nonprofit groups. Some of them have done, I know in Walmart we've had some do, do lots, we've had some do, uh, some of the kids are also in corporate, that especially the older kids, the 18 to 21 year olds, there's two, two phases, 14, 18, and 18, 21. The older children, uh, many of them are placed in professional settings where they're learning, you know, professional skills. Pardon me? Yeah. Education, too. For, for the, for, for the lot maintenance, we began a couple of years ago, actually, at the URA, and we now do it, we're doing it at the city. We actually contract out with local community groups to maintain lots. Um, it used to be just city source, maintain all the lots in the city. We've since then broken it down, where now local community organizations, local community groups can actually apply to take care of lots. So we are, we are doing that. Thank you. And then, I hear what you're saying. I hear you. And we're going to have the next speaker. Uh, and then, then you, we can all respond. I just want to get. Hi, everyone. I'm, my name is Regina Wheeler. I'll be brief. Uh, the meeting was quite interesting, to be quite honest. I'm still learning everything. I'll just speak for my mom. And I live in Spring Hill right now. I am from the north side. I attended Slippery Rock University. I didn't get my degree, but I'm still great. So I want to put that out there. Um, uh, like I said, I live in Spring Hill. I noticed that on your list of uh, communities, you guys are going to be helping, or so you say, I don't want to judge you. Um, 
please consider Spring Hill working with the property owners over there um, because our people over there need opportunities. And so if you have opportunities for them, I think they should know about it. I haven't heard anything. Maybe I missed, missed the letter or something. I don't know. Um, also, I want to speak to with the young lady in the black and, uh, the black and uh, white dress on. Outreach, I just want to speak to, I want to echo her. That's all I want to say is outreach. So if you don't have anybody on your team that does that and can't do it effectively, come see me. I'll help you. Um, what else? We might take you up on that. Yeah, okay. awesome. And um, what else? Uh, I want to say um, that our black men need opportunities. I'm gonna say it louder. Our black men need opportunities. They weren't mentioned. You mentioned black communities, but we can uh, put them in jail and then they can't find work. So like um, somebody mentioned going under hoops and doing this and doing that. Uh, we wanna build our communities. If you're gonna build the black community, build the black man. Um, uh, what else? Um, also, um, my mother, I don't know how long you've owned your home, but you've owned it long enough. So if you can, uh, uh, 22 years, is that what you just said? Okay, um, so uh, if you're going to reiterate what you already spoke about homeowners, that would be great so that we know where we fit in that. And um, uh, I know my time is up. Um, can, I, can I pray for us? Please? How about right after this meeting with we'll the down in Jesus' name, okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other speakers? Did you want to speak, Mom? As she said, I'm her mother. My name is Karen Lane. I live on the north side. I've been in my house for 22 years, okay, and I've dealt with um, URA, okay, and I've dealt with the bank as well, okay, and I know some things are set up for us to fail, especially when you're young black women or just women, period, that's trying to um, keep a roof over your kid's head, okay? And the struggle, y'all say y'all go into the communities. Well, I would like for y'all to come into mine and see like, like um, where we need help at to help build us back up because it's falling apart. And I know for a fact my house is falling apart, but I'm still in it. But I had to go through so many things to, um, to just to keep um, a, a roof over my head. Because there's supposed to be programs out there to help you. And just like she said, you go through hoops and hoops and hoops and nothing gets done. And you're afraid to trust people because they do. You, they end up, you end up have to sell your home. You end up have to give it up. You know what I'm saying? I want to live just like everybody else, okay? But y'all say y'all come into the communities. The, the one way y'all could come in, come see, talk to the people. Talk to them and, and ask them what is their need because there's people that really need financial help due to the COVID, but before the COVID, okay? And nobody came in my and said, what do you need? How can we help you? How much? Um, do you work or you don't work? What do you do? And I can tell them. Okay, I got Social Security. Okay, well, is that going to take care of my bills when I have to, uh, they got me on a budget? And then if I can't keep the budget, they still add that money towards what I got to, and then you got to pay them back that money, and you ain't got the money in the first place to be on the budget. So, see, y'all should think about some of these programs that they got out for our people that they claim that they, they were here to help us. But they're here to fail, keep us failing. Thank you. Any other speakers? I, did, I, I just want to say real quickly, you are bringing up a lot of points about the application process and things that we do when we do give help. But if anybody does need help, I want to tell them that they can get help by calling 211 that should connect you to our services in the city and throughout the county. So you can call 211. It's a free call. And they should be able to give you, all, you know, any kind of resources that are available. But the application process is, is something that I have heard some complaints about, that there's a lot of paperwork. And maybe David Geiger, do you want to talk real quickly about that? Any programs? Do you want to, talk, do you want to respond to anything about um, any of the housing programs? Not yet? Okay. I'm sorry. I saw you stand up. I just have a question because my sister raised a good point here. Just a very simple question. You referenced a stipend of $500 a month that would be given to single mothers. And I'm wondering if that's exclusive or if you're considering single fathers also. Because 
children or children regardless of the custodial parent? I'm, I don't know the particulars of the program. Um, I think it would be, I think it's eligibility is not sex related, gender related. I just said single mothers because that's going to, we know statistically that that's going to be the largest percentage of the population eligible. It doesn't mean though that there won't be single male too, but the, um, in the black community, the fastest way to uh, become poor is to be a single person with a child. And they are disproportionately poor. That is that, that in, in black communities, single mother with children are disproportionately the bulk of households that are poor in black communities. And so when we, when we try to help that, part, that, that area, they're going to make up the, the, the bulk of the recipients just because they're the bulk of the people who are eligible. I understood. Just uh, 20 years in the family division tells me the single fathers get overlooked. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and pointing that out. Any other comments? Seeing none, we're going to uh, join this meeting, but I do want to give the council members a chance to wrap up with any comments. Do you have anything to say? Any of you? No? No one? So with that said, I just want to say that um, I want to thank everyone for these meetings. We were hoping that we would have these types of conversations, and, and so I'm thanking, thank you for that. And we'll continue to stay here afterwards if you want to come up and talk with us a little bit more. Um, but I, I do want to say make sure, again, that I reiterate to call 211 if you are in need of um, any type of services. And if they are not unhelpful or you still need help, then please contact your council members or your state representatives um, or other elected officials and, and try to get some of the help that you need. I can't say that we can cover everything and do everything, but we do try to do the best we can. And there are a lot of services out there that want to make sure that people do get. And I, I want to say that um, I want to point out my husband in the back there who came with me tonight. Stand up, Tom. I just want to say back at um, probably, it was probably about 15 years ago, I think it was, he helped me plant the garden down here at the Pittsburgh Project at the uh, ball field. Before I was ever elected, we came and we planted probably, a, it was probably 90 degrees that day. And I just want to say, when I drove by, I couldn't get over how amazing it looked because it was just little plants when we started. So thank you for your work at the Pittsburgh Project here too. Thank you, everyone. This meeting's adjourned.